As you're watching uh, that video clip and you see the words of the Lord pushed across the screen, it's easy to lose sight of the fact that different perspectives are being offered as you look at these different landscapes and different filters are placed on them, different tones. And it provides sort of an artistic, a robust view of what you're seeing, right? If it was the same view, the same perspective, the video wouldn't be nearly as interesting and nearly as engaging. It's the changing in perspective, it's the new perspective that gives us engagement. It's hard to have a new perspective nowadays. It's it's, it's difficult. We tend to read the same news sources that we always read. We seem to listen to the same people, same people all the time, over and over again. It's easy to get kind of locked into one way of viewing the world, especially as you get older You're not likely to change your perspective that much. You kind of are set in your ways, right? At least that's what I keep telling my kids. I'm set in my ways. It's difficult to change your perspective. There was a conversation that was had in a a great piece of cinema called The Lion King between three friends, uh, Timon, uh, Pumbaa, and uh, Simba. And they're laying on their backs, and they're looking at the stars in the sky, And they're talking about what is it that they're looking at. And each one kind of offers their own perspective. And Pumbaa, who's easily the wisest of the bunch, looks up and says, I was always told that they were giant balls of gas floating millions of miles away. And everybody laughs at Pumbaa. And Timon even says, Pumbaa, with you, everything's about gas. But Pumbaa was right. He had the right perspective. We need new perspectives. I need new perspectives on my week. I'm locked into the same thing that I see over and over and over again. A new new perspective on my relationships, on my family. I don't want to look at things the same way that I always do. I need a a refreshment on my perspective. And so today we're going to talk about that by looking at Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. And we're going to look at the internal change that needs to take place, the external change, the evidence you're going to see of that, and then the eternal change that will take place with a new perspective And so we'll read the passage. Verse 12 says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only in my presence but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. So let's talk about the internal change that needs to take place. Paul is writing to believers that he loves, people he's affectionate for. We've talked about this. This is a good church. Philippians tends to be a a happy letter, right? But there's problems in the Philippian church. There's a little bit of difficulty there. There's division a little bit. There's some grumbling and some complaining that we'll talk about. And there's also opponents from the outside that they're kind of concerned about. They're worried about what's going on outside, and they're worried about Paul as well. And Paul tells them, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, keep on obeying. Keep on obeying is what he wants them to do. Now, we read this, and we think to ourselves, being obedient Oh, here the Bible goes, telling me to follow a bunch of rules again. That's what the Bible does. It tells me to follow rules. And that response, that reaction that we have to obedience shows our deep-seated need for a new perspective. Because we don't even look at obedience the right way. We look at it as a bunch of rules and check marks. When really what God is calling us to is to a lifestyle of following Christ of grace and mercy and forgiveness. That is what the Lord is calling us to, not just following a bunch of rules. And God knows this about us. He knows we need a new perspective. And so he gives us three qualifiers. He tells us what he means by this obedience. He says, one, work out your own salvation. Work out your own salvation. Now, what does he mean by that? Travis, does it sound like Because it does, it kind of sounds like I've got to earn my salvation. This flies in the face of salvation by grace through faith. The problem is this entire book is very communal oriented. It's about community. And so when Paul says to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, what he's telling you is, what he's telling the Philippian church, is that whatever God has done in your life, 
This beautiful story of the world created good and human beings falling from grace because of what Adam and Eve did and continuing on in sin. God doesn't throw us away. Instead, God forgives us. He redeems us. He rescues us. And he's coming again to restore all things. That story, what that happens when we believe in that story, when we trust in Christ, that internal change that takes place has to be worked out into the community of believers. It's got to be worked out into my relationships. It's got to be worked out into my friendships with other people. And it does require a lot of work. It's hard enough to know what I think about a given subject. It's hard enough to know how I feel about things that come across the news. It's hard enough for me to, to, to decide how it is I feel about my relationship with the Lord at any given moment or any given day of the week. It's difficult. And now you're telling me, Travis, that I've got to figure out what it means for other people too. Yeah, it's why he says work out your salvation, not go on vacation with your salvation. It's working out. You gotta work it out like, like uh, uh, yeast is kneaded into dough. It's gotta be pressed in, and that's a lot of work. I've watched enough Great British Baking Show. Those people look busy. I cannot bake, so I don't know, but I assume it's busy. It's a lot of work. But Timon and Pumbaa, great theologians that they are, have the right idea. Those big balls of gas in the sky are important. If we take away the sun, which is a star, but we're not going to talk about him today. He gets enough praise. He gets enough glory. I'm going to go with other stars today. If it's dark at night and there's only one star shining in the sky, it's incredibly difficult to see. That, sure, that star is burning brightly, but it's so far away. You can't see anything with it. But when a bunch of stars are littering the sky, it's resplendent. If you've ever been out away from the light pollution of the city, you can see so many beautiful things by starlight, but it has to be a bunch of stars. It's not just one star. And so us in community, we shine brightly, but only as long as we shine brightly in relationship with other people, in friendships with other people. We are a people, many of us, who are in poverty when it comes to relationships. We may have all the material goods in the world, and we have no friends. Some of us have no family. No people that we would even call family. You're impoverished. You're poor. God is calling us to have a new perspective, to recognize that we need people. And to do this, it requires humility. Look at what the passage says. Work out your salvation with what? Fear and trembling. This is an Old Testament phrase, fear and trembling. It means respect. It means humility. It means adoration. It means to consider other people better than yourselves. It's what we talked about last week. The passage that we're memorizing out of Philippians, chapter 2, talks about the attitude that Christ had. And so when we have this attitude and we have this humility, we stop seeing opportunities to submit ourselves to other people, to put other people first. We stop seeing that as, uh, oh man, I might get walked all over here. I'm not going to get my way. My rights are going to get trampled. We stop looking at it that way and we look at it as an opportunity to worship. The very fact that I might not get my way might be the most glorifying thing in the world to Jesus Christ in that moment. And we talk about it and we say, okay, Travis, I know, Jesus died. I'm expected to die too. I get it. We don't get it. You know how I know we don't get it? Because we don't do it. We don't get it because we don't do it. We're all about winning. We want to win at every possible moment that we can. We hate losing. We hate it. The only problem is we worship a guy who was a loser. Objectively speaking, if we look at it from a non-eternal point of view, Jesus was the biggest loser ever. And on top of that, he had everything going for him and he choked it all away. How many of your football teams lost this weekend? None of yours because you played like Division Three, like people that probably just picked up a football this week and were like, yeah, I'm learning to you know, shoot a rocket into space. I've never thrown a football before. Engineers, good for you. We hate losing, but Jesus was a loser. He came to earth, has all this power, and he didn't show up as like a full-bodied man. He came as a baby. Talk about weak. Talk about powerless. You ever hung around a baby? Can't do anything. You ever played a game, a board game against a baby? They're losers. It's easy to win. I'm undefeated. And then he grows up, and, and you'd think with all this power and all this ability, he would, he would like jump right into ministry. No, he went and made furniture for like 30 years, none of which has survived. There's not a museum that has like the artistic style of Jesus. It's not there. 
And then when he does enter into ministry, he heals some people. And then does he take the show on the road? Sort of. If the road is like the 30-mile radius around Jerusalem, yeah, okay. He doesn't go global. And then when he's finally got this chance to like show the world who he is, he dies. And he was like, yep, can't even save himself. What kind of a savior is that? But here's the thing that Jesus gets that we refuse to understand. Jesus won everything by losing everything. He overturns death by sacrifice. And we look at Jesus and we're like, oh yeah, he's got the victory for me, therefore I don't have to lose. Yes, you do. The way of Jesus is one of suffering and difficulty. It's, it's a long hike, it's a, it's a painful climb, and then when you get to the top, Jesus is like, all right, put your cross up here. You gotta sacrifice, all right, then let's go, let's keep going. This is why we need a new perspective. This is why we need to view things in a different way. Because we don't have that perspective. This is a picture of a nebula right here. Got a nebula there. It's pretty cool. Looks like a dragon. Nebulas are nurseries for stars. Basically, this is where stars are formed and born, and they're shot out into the rest of the, the universe. And those red dots right there, those are actually stars forming in the nebula. And inside of a nebula, it's not peaceful. It's violent. It's turbulent. It's difficult. It's difficult. It's hot because there's usually a, a star nearby that's, that's kind of cooking everything and solar wind is going there. It's turbulent. This is what it's like to follow Christ. Jesus gives us, uh, allows us, probably is better to say, allows us to suffer, allows us to struggle so that we are fused and born into these bright stars for his glory. And yes, he suffers alongside of us. And yes, he holds our hand in the midst of it. But a lot of us think like Jesus raises us up like we raise up our children in quiet little peaceful nurseries with animals painted on the walls. The nursery of Jesus Christ is a lot more like a nebula in the cold vacuum of space than it is a baby's nursery. He uses these things to forge us into the beautiful beings that we're supposed to be. If you're going to be a bright star for the kingdom, your perspective on suffering and difficulty has got to change. And that's where the third qualifier comes in, verse 13. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. I know what you're thinking. I think the same thing. I'm like, well, Travis, that sounds really difficult. That doesn't sound appealing at all. Like, I came here for some encouragement, and you are depressing. This is why God has to work in us to give us a new perspective. It has to be the Lord working in us. Because deep down in the core of my being, I can't change who I am. I can't. I can't reach down far enough. All the willpower and emotional strength I can muster, I might change and become a new person for like a day. But again, set in my ways. I'm not just gonna change overnight, usually. And deep down inside, the Lord has to be the one to reach in and change who we are. That's why you have to seek him in prayer. This is a diagram of a star, the inside of a star. Uh, this is the core of it. There it is. It's not a real picture. I didn't go and slice the star open for you. Sorry, not that talented. But inside the core of a star, there's basically a bunch of nuclear reactions that take place. And it's what fuels the star. It makes it burn brightly. It's also what allows the star to not collapse in on itself. The weight of a star would fall apart. When the core goes away, and we'll talk about this later, the star collapses in on itself. If you do not have Jesus Christ at the core of your being, every time you try to change, every time you try to have a new perspective, every time you try to grow as a person, you might grow for a little bit, you might change for a little bit, but eventually the weight of the expectations that you have, the weight of suffering, the weight of challenge will crush you unless you have Jesus Christ at the core, unless the hot fire of the Spirit of God burns inside of you brightly like a nuclear reactor. Otherwise, you'll fall apart. And this is why we need Jesus. This is why we need the person and work of Christ on us. This is why we need the Spirit of God in us. Because truly, without him, as Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. That is true. And so we have to seek him in prayer. We have to ask him for help and assistance. We have to ask him for this new change. And so you might say, well, Travis, how do I know when this new change has happened? How do I know when I'm burning brightly? Well, let's talk about this external change that's going to take place. External change. Paul moves from talking about the internal change to the external, it's all focused around your mouth. So it's focused around what you talk about. The best way to know is if you, if you have a new perspective or not is how do you talk. And this makes sense. Jesus tells us, Matthew 12, 34, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's true. It's true. If you want to know what's important to you, if you want to know what you think about, what you value, you will talk about it. 
you want to know whether your outlook on life is God-oriented or otherwise, what do you talk about? What do you say? How do you interact with other people? What do you say to them? And he gives us two qualifiers. One, are you, are you complaining? Verse 14, do all things without grumbling or disputing. God tells us to do all things without complaining, not just some things, all things without complaining. And that's a problem for us because we are people that like to complain. How many of you, when you go to buy a new product or you go to a new restaurant, you go on like Amazon or Yelp and you scroll down to the reviews and you don't look at the five-star reviews because we don't care about those. Those were paid for by somebody. I want the one-star reviews. Who are my one-star people? Anybody? Anybody scroll down to the one-star reviews before you buy something? Nice, thank you. The rest of you are liars because you know you do it or you have like a problem where you can't raise your hand, but that's okay. We like to complain and that's okay. Because you come from a long line, we all do, of great complainers. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are part of the people of God, and the people of God are known for complaining. Abraham meets God, talks with him. God's like, I'm gonna bless you. I mean, Abraham's stuff, he gets a bunch of stuff, and it's all good, and God shows up one day. He's like, hey, Abraham, how's it going? He's like, I don't have a son. Everything's terrible. And God's like, all right, tap the brakes. Let's talk about this. The Israelites Go from being enslaved to not enslaved. And they're wandering the wilderness and they're like, this is terrible. We'd be better back in Egypt. Like it almost causes big problems for them. You get to Elijah. Elijah, prophet of God. Part of this like great moment, one of my favorite scenes in all of scripture where fire comes down from heaven and the prophets of Baal are slaughtered. He has this great victory. And then like the next week he's out in the wilderness being like, God, you're gonna let me starve. They're all trying to kill me. The disciples, Jesus, don't you care if we drown? We come from a long line of complainers. You know what complaining is? Blaming other people for your problems. Blaming others for your problems. Blaming God, blaming our parents, blaming our, or blaming our spouses or our, our significant others, blaming our roommates, blaming our friends. Even when you blame yourself, you kind of blame other people. Because we look in the mirror and we think to ourselves, well, if I was smarter, I'd be more successful. If I was prettier, I'd have this. If I was more handsome, I would have this. I had a better job. But really, you're blaming the Lord in that moment. You're blaming the way you were created. You're blaming the way you were made. This is a picture of a black hole. Black hole. It's actually a real picture of a black hole. It's like one of the only ones we have. The reason why it's hard to take a picture of a black hole is because black holes are incredibly dense. So when a star dies, it collapses in on itself sometimes, and it creates this thing called a black hole where nothing can get out. Not even light can escape. So it's really hard to take a picture when there's no light. Some of us, when we enter into this like complain, blame state of life, this is what we become, a black hole. Incredibly dense. So anytime encouragement comes your way, affirmation comes your way, you're like, no, no, no. We suck people into it. People don't want to be around us because we wind up complaining so much. And the worst part is light doesn't escape from a black hole. And the light of Christ, for uh, however long you're in this state of complaining and blaming, can't escape from your life. You don't even look like a believer in these moments when you're complaining. God today wants to give you a new perspective, one that's not full of complaint. One that doesn't make you a black hole, but makes you something greater, a, sh a star shining brightly. And so we ask the question, are you contributing? Verse 15, are you contributing? That you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life so that in, every, that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Paul compares essentially two perspectives on the world. There's the, the crooked view of the world, the, the way that can't get it right, and there's the way that the perspective that Christ gives us. Now, the, the perspective that, that's kind of twisted is one that can't view, refuses to view, is impossible to view things in the way that they should be. And so even when we come to the right conclusion, like, or we, we start off with the right principle, like God loves me, or Jesus died for me, we wind up with the wrong conclusion, like, God loves me, therefore I should have whatever I want. Or God loves me, therefore I can do whatever I want. Or Jesus died for me, I'm forgiven, and so I can get away with whatever I want to get away with. Or we reverse it. We say, Jesus died for me, I'm not worthy of that, therefore God hates me. And we become legalists and rule followers. When you have a work, wicked and crooked view of life, you can even start out with some really good ideas and wind up at the wrong conclusion. 
But there's the other perspective, the perspective that Paul gives us here. He tells us to shine brightly. This word to, to shine brightly like lights. The word lights there is actually the, the Greek word for stars. And so it's not lights. He's talking about starlight. It's why we're using the image of stars today. And he tells us that the way we engage with other people should be blameless, innocent, without blemish. What does that mean? It doesn't mean morally. It means in our talking, in our speech with other people. To be blameless means are you contributing? How are you contributing to the conversations of our day? When you talk to other people, when you talk to friends and family and relatives and, and, and coworkers, and you talk about the issues of the day, are you contributing to division, to anger, to malice, or are you contributing to peace and justice and righteousness? How do your words contribute? Are they blameless? Or can we lay the blame for division in our world at your feet squarely as we can at other people's? Are you blameless? What about pure? Is it innocent? The word innocent can mean pure. We think pure like, oh, don't tell a dirty joke. Sure, that works. But it also means don't, uh, don't, don't mix something with other things. Something pure is something that's not mixed with other things. So when you speak, are your compliments or your encouragements mixed with tearing people down? How are, they, how are your, your comments is it without blemish? Now, again, you're sitting here thinking, Travis, you're asking me to be super optimistic, and that's just not who I am. I'm a realist. Okay, well, one, maybe you need a new perspective, just, suggest, just saying, suggestion. But two, I'm asking you to be real, to be authentic. You can decry the problems that we have in the world. You can be upset about the tragedies that happen in your life, absolutely. You see it throughout Scripture, God's people grieving, not just complaining, but grieving over what has happened. Next week, we'll talk about Paul having sorrow upon sorrow. That's not complaining. Because remember, complaining is blaming other people for your problems. You can grieve. You can mourn. But you can do it without complaining. And that's what it means here to be without blemish. And then he says to hold fast to the word of life. Hold fast to the word of life. Are you life-giving in your speech? I struggle with this. I like to be funny. I like to crack jokes. And sometimes those jokes can be rather cutting. They can hurt people's feelings. If we're going to hold fast to the word of life, we have to ask one question. How does the great story of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, his resurrection, how does it change the way I talk about this subject? The fact that the world was good and it fell, Christ redeemed it, and now he's going to restore all things when he returns. How does that great story change the way in which I engage in all sorts of conversations, like politics? Some of us talk about politics as if Christ is not coming back, as if the next person that gets elected or the next person that gets, the next law that gets passed is going to end the entire world. Is that the perspective of somebody that believes that one day the king will return? And that we won't have a democracy, we'll have a monarchy at that point. You don't get a vote in the kingdom of God, just letting you know that. That's something to be longed for, it's something to be hoped for. How do you talk about politics? Is it life or death with you? Or is it eternal life or eternal death with you? What is it? Are you contributing to the light or are you contributing to the dark? What does your speech do? How are you contributing? And then let's talk about the eternal change. Verse 17 even if I'm to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Paul closes by giving a worst case scenario that he might die in prison, that he might die in jail. And he talks about a drink offering. A drink offering was something that was familiar to Greeks and to Hebrews alike. Basically what it is is you'd go in and you'd offer your sacrifice to a god or a goddess and it would be a goat or a sheep or whatever it was that you offered. And then on top of it, you would pour out a drink offering. It's like in addition to. It's like, it's like and I really like this god and I want them to like me, so I'm going to pour out a drink offering on top of it, right? And Paul's saying that I've already given a lot. Uh, he's got a whole passage in scripture where he talks about being beaten, shipwrecked, all this other stuff happens to him, arrested numerous times. He's like, yeah, I've already sacrificed a lot but more might be asked of me. I might be asked to give my life for the cause of Christ. And if that happens to us in our situation, what we typically do is we say, why me, God? How much more are you gonna ask from me? And I understand there's grief in that. It's okay to ask God questions like that. But notice that we don't ever ask God more blessing upon blessing. We don't ever ask God, how much more are you gonna bless me than you already have? 
It tends to be a lopsided question when we get to why me? Why me? Paul's talking about here is he's talking about the end of his life. And he's talking about this great opportunity he has. Maybe the greatest opportunity he has to give glory to God. He's talking about going supernova. You'll see a picture of a supernova here on the screen. Uh, a supernova happens when a star dies, and the core of the star sh shrinks from about 5,000 miles wide to about 12 miles wide. It's very rapid, and when it happens, the outside of the star collapses just as quickly, but it rebounds. And when it rebounds back out, the star looks like it explodes, and it creates a supernova. And dust and gas and elements and all stuff, sorts of stuff are flung out into the universe, and they wind up in nebulas where new stars are made from them. And Paul's talking about this, this time in his life might be a time when, when he goes supernova. The end of his life erupts and new believers, new people might be made because they read, they hear, they experience what he's going through. You see, when a star goes supernova, sometimes it is brighter than galaxies for days or weeks. And we recognize this. The life of Paul has shined brighter. Obviously, he's inspired by the Holy Spirit, so there's a part of that. But his life, some believers, their lives have shined brighter than entire churches have. It's because they went supernova. It reminds me of Vincent van Gogh. Vincent van Gogh was an artist back in the late 1800s, Dutch, tragically took his life. But the two years before he took his life, he had this most productive period of his entire life. He's painted like 200 paintings, and he painted this. Many of you know it. It's called Starry Night. And what I think is so beautiful about this is this is a terrible depiction of stars. And we can't stop looking at it. We can't stop thinking about it. For, for 150 odd years, we have looked at this painting and it's like one of the most recognizable things in the world. The starlight, the, the supernova that was Van Gogh's life ended tragically, yes. But the light of it continues on into our lives. Are you willing for the glory of God to let your life, to let a season of challenge and difficulty be a supernova event. And Paul says, if you have that opportunity, rejoice. Be excited, be glad, rejoice with me because I have this opportunity. Rejoice. And you're sitting there thinking to yourself, Travis, that sounds awful. You're talking about stars dying and exploding. I don't want my life to be like that. How can I possibly have a life like that? Here's why. Here's why you can rejoice. Because 2,000 years, years ago, there was another supernova, the cross of Christ the greatest supernova in history. Jesus goes to a cross of wood and nails and he hangs there and he dies for us. And then he's resurrected and the moment his eyes open, the moment he wakes up, the light of the glory of God is shot through the ages. And every person who by faith trusts and believes in Jesus Christ as their Savior, not in their own work, not in their own ability to shine brightly, not in their own ability to have a new perspective, but whoever puts their faith in him all of a sudden has the starlight of Jesus Christ inside of them. And they begin to shine brightly too. Not with their own light, but with the light of Christ. And you're a new star born again in the nebula of Christ's love. And so we have joy because we know the suffering, the difficulty, the challenges that you face in your life. Opportunities to shine brightly. You know, stars are shining all the time. We just can't see them because the sun's really bright. Which is good. I like the sun. Again, big fan. Thanks. But at night, when it's dark, and you're away from the city, you can look up and you can see thousands of stars. It might be difficult sometimes to see the light of Christ in our life when things are going good. Not because we're not honoring him, but just because there's not a contrast. But when things are difficult, when things are hard, when things are at their darkest, that's when stars shine brightest, right? Jesus Christ wants to use the suffering and the pain and the difficulty, that he, he doesn't, he suffers with you. He hurts with you. He's not sitting there inflicting it upon you because he doesn't love you. He loves you. And because he loves you, he's gonna give you the opportunity to shine brightly for his glory. He's gonna hold your hand in the midst of it. We have to have a new perspective. We have to have an eternal perspective on it. And I know it's hard. I know it's difficult to remember those things. When you're in the middle of pain and suffering, you, you're sitting there and you're like, Travis, I'm going to have a rough week. It's going to be Wednesday. I'm going to be fighting with somebody, arguing with my spouse, whatever. And you're going to be sitting there being like, I don't remember what you said about suffering. That's why God gives us things to remember by. 